So welcome to the second lecture of the late modern English era. We talked about vocabulary expansion in the early uh, modern English era and um, sorry, that, that, that's a typo. That should actually be the late modern English era uh, because of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of the British Empire. And now I want to come to the fact that English in this era started becoming the lingua franca of the world. So what English really became at this uh, point was what we call as the global language. So up until this, um, the late modern English era, up until like the 17th century, no language had dominance over the world. So there was nothing remotely even close um, to a global language. Um, and so with the rise of the British Empire, what happened was English started penetrating a lot of different countries, a lot of different areas of the world. And so the language of communication, the medium of communication was English. And so these were the areas where English was really spoken, North America, so that's both USA and Canada from 17th century, um, islands of the Caribbean, 17th century, Australia and New Zealand from 18th century, and South Africa from 19th century. So you can see that these are predominantly English speaking areas today. But you also have areas that are not predominantly English speaking today, like they speak English as a second language, but these also contribute to uh, English as a global language. So these are Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, colonies in Africa, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Gambia, Nigeria, Cameroon, Liberia, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe, and South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. So what's a global language? Well, a global language is a language that has a special role in the world, right? It has a special role maybe in like education, it has a special role in government, or it could be a mix of both. Um, and it also has dominant widespread use throughout the country. There are different ways in which languages can have special status. So one is basically it's the mother tongue or the home language. So English is currently the mother tongue of America, even though it's not a language that is native to America by any means, but it is spoken as the first home language. It's, it could be the official language uh, of a country. And so um, it, that's the case in uh, India. So I grew up speaking English as an official language, which is official language status in India. Um, and also strongly promoted in education. So in a lot of countries around the world where English uh, or England had colonized uh, the country, um, there was a strong promotion of that particular language in education. So let's take each of these uh, and, and look at it in detail. So what does it mean to be, um, when I say that the language can be a mother tongue? Well, English is a mother tongue of the majority of speakers in only a few of the world's 300 countries, right? But it's considered a global language, not because of any widespread mother, mother tongue status, right? So it's not, it's not a global language because it is spoken uh, in, in a lot of countries, but obviously within these countries, majority of the people speak the language. Official language status, uh, it, it is actually an official language in over 70 countries of the world. Uh, and the main competitors for this are French, German, Spanish, Russian, and Arabic. Uh, but obviously a lot of these languages are kind of tied to specific areas of the world. And so it'll take a lot to, for them to overthrow English. Language could also be promoted in education. So English is used as a medium in schools and universities, uh, for example, and many, many schools actually teach English as a second language. So for example, in Algeria in 1996, English replaced French as a chief foreign language being taught in schools. Currently, there are about 1.5 billion people who speak English across the globe. Um, and the second most commonly known language is Chinese, and that's approximately spoken by 1 billion people. Uh, but the majority of uh, people who speak Mandarin Chinese are located in China, and therefore it's not globally widespread. And that's why Chinese or Mandarin is not a global language. So what causes a language to be globally dominant? Well, um, at various stages, various languages were dominant. So if you see Latin, Latin was dominant when um, you know, the Roman Empire was powerful when the Catholic Church was dominant and powerful. Latin used to be um, a very dominant language. It's linguistically very easy to learn uh, and use is obviously not a factor, right? Because, I mean, if you look at Latin, Latin is not a very easy language to learn um, and, and, and usability was also not a factor at that point. 
Languages are dominant because they're not easy, not because they're easy to learn, but because they have military, economic, and cultural power, right? So we often talk about English being at the right place at the right time because of colonization, because of trade, because of industrial revolution, because of where they were dominantly um, military dominance, economic dominance, and cultural dominance in the world at that point. So when we talk about uh, colonization, for example, by the start of the 19th and 20th century, Britain was the world's leading industrial and trading country, right? So Britain was a superpower in the 19th century. And USA had a population larger than any country in Western Europe, and predominantly all of USA were speaking English at that point by, by the end of 19th century. And during 20th century, um, the English was powered by the leading role of USA in the world economy. So after Britain, USA became uh, the world's leading uh, economic leader. And therefore, again, English was at the right place at the right time. The discovery of the new world, uh, for example, Columbus landed in the Americas, right? Um, and that's how English came into the new world. So this was around like 15th century. So this also aided in um, the propagation of English. What happened uh, during this period in America was that, um, well, around 1783, the British troops withdrew from America. And the first settlers in America actually spoke an uh, early modern English variety of English because obviously, you know, that's the, that's the era that they started coming in, like 16th century, 17th century. And they actually discovered America as a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men, right? Because these were the first people that they encountered. Right. And this is I'm quoting them. So it's not um, it's not an exaggeration. You can actually see this in books. Um, and and obviously the kind of languages that they encountered, the kind of people that they encountered were very different from the kind of people that they were exposed to in Europe, uh, for example. So here is a map of the settlement of the English colonies. Obviously, they came to the east coast of America because that's what is closer to um, England when you said sail from England. And so you can see the New England colonies, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, Connecticut, uh, Boston, Plymouth, Rhode Island. Um, and then you have the uh, middle colonies, which is Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Philly, Wilmington, Delaware, etc., and the southern colonies. Um, that's Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, etc. So, um, well, obviously, people, uh, the British people who came into America at the point, encountered with the previous settlers of America, that's French, Spanish, and the Dutch. And so when the English people came, they first came to Jamestown, uh, Virginia in 1620, and the Pilgrim Fathers settled in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. So it was around 1620 that you first start to see um, the English settlers coming in and starting to settle in America. But the English settlers, unlike like the French and Spanish and Dutch, uh, they came to stay and they wanted to propagate their language. So we could clearly imagine in America if not for the English, we would be speaking Spanish or we would be speaking French, right, as of us language right now. But clearly the agenda was different for English. In, the English settlers really wanted Americans to speak English. And so this is the birth of American English. This is really the period when we start to see the dialect of American English that's very different from the British English uh, dialect. And it ties in with the fact that around the 18th century or around the 19th and 20th century, America became one of the leading world powers. What did American English, the early version, sound like? Well, sometimes people often refer to the early American English as colonial lag, where people actually use frozen pronunciations um, while those pronunciations changed in Britain, but they kind of lagged and stayed the same. They froze uh, in America. So in a lot of respects, American English during that period, early uh, American English period, was closer to the English of Shakespeare than modern British English actually is. So here are some usages uh, that uh, have not, that have kind of faded away from Britain and um, British English, but uh, American people still use it. Fall for autumn, trash for rubbish, hog for pig, sick for ill, guests for think, and loan for lend. Uh, but also America kept a lot of words that have been largely dropped in Britain. And again, some of these words are very new to me. I don't know the meaning of a lot of them. Maybe you do. Uh, but things like burly and greenhorn and talented and scant and lumber and lot. Um, I do know lumber and lot and scant and talented, but 
not sure about Greenhorn. Um, there's also a dialect of English, which is called Appalachian uh, English, which is spoken in the Appalachian Mountains, and this is actually closer to Shakespearean speech. It's often uh, treated as a different dialect of uh, American English, but uh, definitely with ties to early modern American English rather than modern English. So you have a lot of words there that really look like they are from the early modern English era. These are all from the Appalachian dialect of English. So, um, well, whatever I'm going to be saying for the rest of this video is going to be very familiar with you because I'm going to be talking about American English. So American English obviously have the, uh, the, the wall ah is more prominent than the wall ah. So American English says things like dance instead of dance or swan instead of swan or ways instead of was. So you have that kind of distinction. Um, and, um, um, on a personal note, when I first came to America um, 10 years or so, um, I, I would say things with a British accent. So I would say dance and swan and was, and um, it, it was really odd teaching, uh, you know, spoiled brats at USC because obviously they didn't understand what I was saying and they would be like, what the hell is she talking about? So now 10 years later, I, I use dance and ways and you know more of the american english pronunciations because i think i've adapted um to speaking that way but earlier it was really difficult with the you know the british versus the english kind of um the american english kind of differences so here is another difference the pronunciation of the r um so in american english you always roll your r so you say bird instead of bird uh, in british english or car instead of car and um, in a lot of ways, actually, American English is more conservative. So we have lost some vocabulary like waistcoat and fortnight and cops and thin and heat and more. Um, but we also have new compounds in terms of flora and fauna. So like underbush and raccoon and woodchuck and sweet potato. A lot of these are actually borrowed from the native Indian languages that existed in uh, Britain before English came in. And obviously, British English does not have any of these. And there are spelling differences as well. So in British English, you often see uh, the UE form, um, right? Or the C-O-L-O-U-R uh, for color, uh, cider with the Y, cipher with the Y, pajamas with the Y, tire with the Y. And in American English, you can see it's all with the I, uh, for example, cider, cipher, tire. And check is with the K and not with the Q-U-E. The person who is accredited with the changing of the spelling in American English is Noah Webster and his American Spelling Book, 1788. And um, it's, a, it's probably the best-selling book in American history after the Bible. So people really, really like Webster's dictionary or spelling book. So he is the one who revised a lot of the spellings from British English, so like color, C-O-L-O-U-R, or H-O-N-O-U-R for honor. Um, and change that into C-O-L-O-R. Uh, traveler, jeweler, uh, with the two L's in British English, check and mask with the Q-U-E, defense and offense with the C-E to the S-E, and plow uh, and aluminum, I still say it the British way, aluminum, uh, because that's how we write it, A-L-U-M-I-N-I-U-M, -I -I but in American English it's aluminum uh, without the I, and plow uh, without the U-G-H. So, well, Americans actually liked the fact that Webster was taking ownership of the language because they wanted, Americans of, Americans of that era wanted their own identity. They wanted to be separate from the British people who colonized them. And so it was a matter, it was an honor for the newly independent nation, right? When the British troops started leaving in 1760s, this was really when uh, people appreciated it. But obviously there were people who also had opinions about spelling. So Webster was by no means the only one. And so there's uh, Joseph Worcester, um, and he had a more conservative British influenced approach. And so there were dictionary wars that ensured between Webster and Worcester. Uh, and obviously, it was at this point that Andrew Carnegie and President Roosevelt supported a reform spelling in the early 20th century. So here are some of the spellings that Roosevelt, um, President Roosevelt actually uh, reformed in the early 20th century. So catalog, clasped, gauge, program, and thorough, right? Now, obviously, just like British pronunciations came into American English, certain American 
uh, words went into the British English um, dialect. And so these are called as Americanisms. So belittle, blizzard, caucus, prairie, swamp, cloudburst, etc., were words that were very particular to the American uh, kind of terrain. Uh, but British English people do know these words and use these words often. And many new words have come into British English usage in recent times, like cafeteria, filling station, highbrow, lowbrow, cocktail, egghead, etc., are new words that British English has borrowed from American English. Here are some of the syntactic differences. So with collective nouns, for example, in American English, you have the public is outraging. And in British English, the public are outraging. I still use a British English format because grammar is something that is still a lot more difficult to change from the way that you've been brought up. Um, so I still use, I still have this collective noun uh, problem with American and British English. I still use British English version. Plural verbs are frequent. So in American English, you say England awaits chance to mop up. Uh, but in British English, you say England await a uh, chance to mop up. Choice of preposition, uh, and this is again something that a lot of people have debates about, right? What preposition to use? So American English has John lives on Elm Street, but in British English, you say John lives in Elm Street. In the normal area, you will see that, well, in American English, you have relative pronouns and reflexive pronouns that increase in usage. Um, double negative, uh, very common in certain dialectal forms of American English, and use of perfect and progressive, such as I have been to Germany. This was also the era when uh, many popular dictionaries, including the dictionary that you used for your assignment two, um, were created. So the Oxford English Dictionary uh, began um, in 1857 and was completed in 1928 in 12 volumes. So it was a very, uh, it was a project that had a long duration, uh, for example. And obviously there were a lot of supplemental volumes that came out uh, of the Oxford English Dictionary. And in 1992, it was made electronic and available online. Thank God, because otherwise I don't know how you would have done your assignment to. The Oxford English Corpus is also another good resource with over 2 billion words of 21st century um, English. And there's also the Webster's third new international dictionary. And this is one of America's greatest contribution to the dictionaries around the world. It was first published in 1961. Here are some differences in pronunciation. So you have in uh, American English, either or neither, or you can either you can say either or neither as well. Softening of the we instead of the first, so nephew instead of nephew. Uh, but obviously, you say lieutenant and I say lieutenant, right? So there are differences in pronunciation. As well as intonation, so that's a very good marker. So in American English, the intonation is always at the end of the sentence. So where are you going to be versus in um, British English, is it where are you going to be, right? So there's differences in intonation. American English is always at the end. British English is always at the beginning. Uh, and last, I have a couple of videos over here that, again, you can watch at your own pace. This is the world's English mania. It's a TED Talk by Jay Walker, uh, where people, he talks about communities across the world that really want to learn English because they see English as a language of opportunity. Um, and I also have two other TED Talks, um, Don't Insist on English. So one uh, TED Talk of Patricia Ryan, Ideas in All Languages, Not Just English, and by Jamila um, Lyscott, Three Ways to Speak English. Okay, and I will see you in the uh, next module, which is World Englishes.